Hi, I realize I'm a little off with the scripture study, and so if you're not managing to get around to it, my apologies, but um, just got a little distracted earlier in the week and so didn't have an opportunity to do this as quickly and as promptly as I have done it in parallel with when we typically offered it offered this as an in-person gathering on Tuesdays. So without further ado, let me get into the scriptures of this week. Um, I'm pretty far along in my sermon preparation and, and composition at this point, so I know the direction that I'm taking with things. Nonetheless, I will try to hold that back as much as I can to let the scriptures each uniquely speak to you on this day. As in the past, I always encourage you to think about context, given the context within the biblical narrative, the context in our liturgical year, so where we are in the church calendar, and the context of everything that's going on around us that will frame how we hear Scripture. And so it's important to keep in mind uh, for each of us what our context is, even the context of our own individual lives and what's happening within that will frame how we hear Scripture. So, without further ado, let me get into the Old Testament. Again, we're following the lectionary. I'm working on the summer series. I think I now have four scriptures, so I at least have a short series to go on. Probably will start that, um, not this upcoming week, but the week that follows that. So it'll sort of span uh, part of July and into August. I think that's a good way to proceed with it. Anyway, uh, so we are with the lectionary for the next couple of weeks, and then we will depart into that summer series. So with the lectionary, we have Old Testament, uh, part of Paul's a letter from the New Testament, usually from the Apostle Paul, and then Gospel. And this year, uh, being the year that we're in, is the Gospel of Matthew that we hear from. We've been reading from Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome. That's where we continue this week. And we have been reading from Genesis and the story of Abraham. And that's where we also continue this week. The Old Testament reading is longer this week. And so bear with me as I read through it. Uh, but it is a bit longer uh, than in prior weeks than last week, um, but is part of just trying to keep this story together as a whole. So I'm going to read through it, and uh, then with what follows, I'll provide a little interpretation if I have some. I encourage you as I read through it to also kind of paint the scene in your head and, and get the characters that are involved um, all present and see how it leads you. And our objective here is, what is the truth that these stories speak to our lives? So it's not just a piece of history that we read, but a truth that they speak to, which is why these stories become important. Um, I heard recently in an, in an interview that I was listening to, and it was talking about theater and whether theater will come back. And the person said, for as long as human beings have been around, they've been telling stories around the fire, or they've been telling stories in the dark. And they were comparing the theater to telling stories in the dark, which it very much is. Well, the biblical narrative is like that as well. These are stories that have been told for generation to generation to generation. Why? Because they speak of truths about God and about our lives, and so therefore the stories themselves end up being timeless, even though their characters and the particulars of the story are frozen from a moment in time, they speak to something that is timeless. And that's kind of what our objective is as we explore scripture, is to look for that which is timeless in them. So this is Genesis 24, 34 through 38, 42 through 49, in 58 through 67. Why does it skip around like that? It's trying to keep this particular episode connected. And so it could be that those pieces that are that are kind of cut out of this by the lectionary editors don't help the story to stay connected. And so this is a way to try to keep this particular episode as connected as possible. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become wealthy, and he's given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male, female, slaves, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old, and he has given him all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live but you shall go to my father's house, to my kindred, and get a wife for my son. I came today this, to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, 
If now you will only make successful the way I am going. I'm standing here by the spring of water. Let the young woman who comes out to draw, to whom I shall say, please give me a little water from your jar to drink. And who will say to me, drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman who the Lord has appointed for my master's servant. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca coming out with her water jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew. I said to her, please let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will also water your camels. So I drank, and she also watered the camels. Then I asked her, Whose daughter are you? She said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcal bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. Then I bowed my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to obtain the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, if you will deal loyally and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, so that I may turn either to the right hand or to the left. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will. So they sent away their sister Rebekah and her nurse, along with Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, May you, our sister, become thousands of myriads. May your offspring gain possession of the gates of their foes. Then Rebekah and her maids rose up, mounted the camels, and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had come from ber Leharoi and was settled in the Negev. Isaac went out in the evening to walk in the field, and looking up, he saw camels coming. And Rebekah looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she slipped quickly from the camel and said to the servant, Who is the man over there walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself, and the servant told Isaac all the things he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. All right, so this is the episode where Rebecca uh, becomes part of the family of Isaac. Um, what kind of truths does this speak to us? So this becomes hard in some ways. As I was reading it, I was trying to read it with an opener, a fresh mind. We have Abraham's servant. So Abraham became quite wealthy during his lifetime. He left everything he had to his son Isaac, and that would include those, let's call them farmhands, but the helpers or servants he had also. And so there was instructions that the servant, in order to find a fitting bride for Isaac, who now was in possession of all of this wealth, was to go back to where Abraham was from. That's what it means by his kinsfolk. It doesn't it doesn't literally mean his own family, but it means his, his region, where he was from, his, his peoples, so his kinsfolk, uh, and there to find an appropriate bride, or that would be where he would choose a bride uh, for Isaac. Now, why is that? Well, maybe for himself, it's hearkening back to his own connection with Sarah and wanting the same uh, love and joy that he found with Sarah, and he found that there and so familiarity we don't know it doesn't tell us the story doesn't tell us but we have the servant uh, who prays to the god of his master abraham which might suggest in some ways that he doesn't hold the same faith though again we do not know that gets that far so he's taken others with him but not isaac and comes to that place thirsty a well a uh, common thing in that arid area that's where you would collect and and get water for the animals that you had ridden. And um, his prayer is sort of one of ease. Just let the first person who comes up here, let her be right. Uh, and it just so happens that it is. Now, this would have likely been one of the chores that unwed 
um, and unbetrothed women would have been responsible for in their household. So if it wasn't a servant, if there weren't servants within a family, this may have lied upon them to do. And so when we have her with her own water jug coming, it's really just saying she was doing her chores. She happens to be very polite and hospitable. Now there may be a message for us. It's a message that harkens back to Abraham, his hospitality to angels, that perhaps linking that with Rebecca as a way to linking in to how those who will be part of this family that God is going to continue to grow, what their core or fundamental reality is. And perhaps it is one of hospitality. She puts aside her chore, her needs, to care for the needs of another first. In doing so, in doing that act, now whether that's the servant seeing God intervening, uh, or whether it's just showing him how she is like his now deceased master Abraham, don't know, it appears that he thinks this is more God's direct intervention in this story, irrespective, his then putting a ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arm is a way to claim, I hate to use that terminology, but to invite her to then um, become the wife of Isaac. So one of the ways, and the wedding ring in some ways is still an expression of that, that it was expressed that you were no longer single, was through the use of jewelry, and in this case we have something of that region and the way that used jewelry there, such as with a ring through the nose and bracelets. Um, so that's probably the symbolic value of the jewelry that we have in the story. Then from that, there is an interesting uh, back and forth, and, and so it's her going to her family and... Um, they say, are, are you going to go with, with him? So he's been outright saying, I'm not the person. My master is elsewhere, um, but he is looking a, for a wife from his father's kinsfolk. Will you go with me? It's sort of kind of the impression that we have. And among all her sisters, we know this will become um, important in other ways. But anyway, um, they they... After she says she's going to go, uh, they send her away. Now, now, why send her away so easily? Well, maybe she wasn't first in line so far down the number of sisters that there was that the chance of marriage or, or really a marriage that would, um, a marriage at all or a marriage that would have any sort of um, dowry associ associated with it was very low. And so this was the only possibility for her to have life. That might be one one reason, based on the context of that time and how marriage was and relationships were, that could be that, uh, with that, hard to say. Anyway, they go on their merry way. They go back to where Isaac is. Uh, he sees from far away. She steps off her camel. Um, the, the veil is really an expression that um, the person that she's to marry shouldn't really see her she shouldn't be unveiled. She shouldn't be revealed until they are truly together, uh, which happens in short order. So for me, I, I see sort of this the, the truth that speaks to me being one of, do we find this to be a story of God's direct intervention in the matters of life? Or is this an expression how those who um, become part of the family of God, those who are of God, have certain qualities or traits that bring them into connection with, with others that are also followers of God. Things like hospitality to strangers and to others. And that is a prevailing theme of the Old Testament. So it could be a great message for, for what it means to be a follower of God and a willingness to go in places and with people that we could never imagine all stemming out of that basic hospitality, which leads to a, a blessed life. Um, but maybe you hear a different truth in there. I'd, I'd be curious what that might be um, in that story. And of course, it's very different. This is one of those times in which the context of relationships and marriage is so different than our own. It's really hard to hear 
within the story or to separate it from the way we are now. So certainly the way that um, women were approached, which was much more in a possessed or possessive reality rather than as an independent uh, and valued person on their own. Although Rebecca, just like Sarah, is known by name, um, so there are things that do seem to contradict that a little bit. But anyway, I know sometimes that can be uneasy to hear, hear those things. Um, Romans continues kind of where we were, and um, this is a passage which for me has always resonated uh, because Paul, he is known for his apostolic ventures and all the people he has brought to, to Christ and all the churches he has planted. But Romans is, is very much um, an expression of his own challenge that even with the best of intentions, even knowing what is right and what it is to be a follower of Christ, that he still falls short of that, that he still unfortunately is can, inclined and, and he chalks it up sort of to human nature or our um, debased selves, our sinful selves, that rebel constantly and have to be reminded of God's grace and forgiveness and um, work uh, to achieve on connection with God. So I find in this passage resonance um, in, with Paul, and maybe you'll find it too, but let me read it to you. He says, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what is what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of good in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So Paul sort of separates in this, and this may go into some of my, my personal theology, so that is my understanding or belief about God. But Paul, what I sense in this, is, is wrestling with this idea that um, we know what is right and good inside, and yet somehow constantly we are doing things that are contrary to that, that are different than what is right and good. Um, whether that's sin of omission, so forgetfulness or not doing, or um, sins of direct action, of doing what we know we shouldn't. Uh, and I think of this all the time when I lose my patience or when um, I don't commit and do everything that I should do when I'm not as fastidious as I should be, when I'm not as um, dedicated or devoted in, in uh, my prayer life even, um, or in other ways as I should be. So for me, this, this helps me to understand that God knows and sees the best version of me, but that best version is often corrupted by outside forces. And those outside forces kind of lie all around me. It's the world I live in. It's the motivations. You know, Paul, other places will say the motivations of the flesh. But, you know, of, of meeting our own desires. So this is satisfying our hungers. So when we really shouldn't have that second dessert, it's there and we eat it because it's there. Not because it's right, because we know it's not right. Um, so indulgence, self-centeredness, those kind of things. Uh, and, and Paul is saying there is no way to do it on our own. We are incapable of resisting all of this on our own. And so he concludes with thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Is in Jesus, 
we are forgiven, grace is placed upon us, and we spend a lifetime in the process of sanctification, letting the holiness of our true selves that lies within become the holiness of our lives and our actions in the world. So for me, this passage is reassuring, particularly I think at this time where things are so challenging it's become really easy to, to, to be self-centered or, or to be grumpy about conditions, is Paul is saying that grumpiness is actually not your true self. It's all the forces around you. It's the evil and sin which can, it, which can so easily cloud your judgment and, um, and rule your behaviors. And that the objective is to recognize those and to recognize that we, we aren't capable of, of getting beyond them without help in, in Christ, seeking forgiveness out, recognizing we can't do it on our own. And then, and then we might have the help that we need to let the person that God knows us to be in the inside come to be the person that is in existence in the world. Um, so there's a little take on that passage from my perspective. So um, the, the gospel passage, the last passage that we have, is Matthew 11. This jumps around and skipping a few verses in the middle as well. It goes 16 through 19 and 25 through 30. Um, don't know that there's a really good connection between the epistle passage and the Old Testament passage. I'm not sure there's really much of a connection between the gospel and the Old Testament passage. So this is one of those times where the linearity of the, of the lectionary, so that is these times and seasons in which the readings just build upon one another, don't correlate into a homily. So that is using the three passages in a connected way, but probably one of those times in which a single passage will be used for a sermon for the proclamation of the word. So Jesus here uh, says, this is rather condemnatory. Maybe there's a good connection in that regard to the epistle passage. He says, But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He is a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I think there are actually three sort of distinct parts to this, and they don't all necessarily hang together, in, in my estimation. So the first part is this um, exploration of what the people are like. Now, Matthew's gospel is really uh, an indictment. It's the gospel to the Jews, and Luke's gospel is the gospel to the Gentiles. And so the audience is very different. Matthew's gospel tends to be very um, indicting to, to the Jews. And it's, it's, a, it's a, an apologetic. It's, it's a, the idea is to show, to showcase to them how Jesus is the Messiah and how much that was missed in order to convert. Um, so we have Jesus saying, what am I going to compare the people who are around this generation to? And he compares them to children who sit in the marketplaces. So the marketplaces were open air markets that existed then for trading goods. And um, basically what those children did is beg for alms. And so when it says, I, I played the flute for you, and you did not dance, we wailed, you did not mourn, is um, these were things that were done for money, and so what am I going to compare this generation? But like petulant children who only sought uh, their own fulfillment, the fulfillment of their bellies that wanted money. 
Um, and why is he saying that? Well, he's saying it for two reasons. Number one, John the Baptist came and they dismissed him. They dismissed him as uh, because he didn't eat or drink. Now, we know that John had an interesting diet and lived out in the woods. So basically, they dismissed him uh, as having any authority or having anything worthy to li listen to because of his lifestyle. And then Jesus is saying the Son of Man came. So we have John, who didn't eat and drink, lived this, you know, lifestyle that was secluded and off on his own. And then Jesus comes, and he lives life with the people, and that becomes also an indictment. So it doesn't matter whether you're you live off on your own or you live with the people. Um, the indictment is, you know, John's what he has a demon. That's why he's different. He lives off on his own. And what Jesus is, well, he eats with the wrong people and he's drunk and, uh, and, and hangs about with social outcasts. Um, says, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. So essentially it's saying that you're not listening to the right voices. So in the long run, you're so dismissive of these things, so quick to judge, but wisdom is going to have the last ruling on this. Uh, then we have Jesus moving into a prayer. And I may change what I'm going to preach on because somebody has said that they find this particular verse very perplexing, which fits in with the summer series without intending to. Uh, but at that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and revealed them to infants. And it's his way of really being, again, an indictment against those who thought they were wise. But they were selfishly wise. They were wise only in ways of the law and saw only you know, within that reason to condemn others. But they weren't really wise in the sense of being aware or a willingness to be aware of God's movement in the world and through others. And so this is an indictment against them, those that the world at his time was declaring wise and intelligent and revealing it to infants. And in this case, he's saying to those that largely those who are wise and intelligent have dismissed as having anything of value to offer to society. Um, so that's sort of what it means by, by infants. And that being God's, God's will, how it is with God. Um, and it concludes with this last piece, which doesn't seem to be part of the prayer anymore, and that's an invitation to all. So maybe there's the hospitality back to Rebecca offering water, how it is with those who are followers of God, those who are of God. Anyway, come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. Well, sinners, tax collectors, you know, the people that Jesus reached out to, this is largely the message that he promotes to them. Uh, Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. So be like me. Uh, and there's the message that connects it back to Paul, too. Be like me. I know that you're finding life heavy and burdensome, that... You're not the people that God knows you to be inside. Come to me and start to live out that best version of yourself. Uh, and you're going to find that it's easy and lighter than this other way. So I thought I had a clear idea of where I was going, but um, that one passage, that one line is something that I know for somebody has been um, a challenge. And so whether I decide to take that on, I'm not sure. But perhaps, perhaps. I apologize that this is late going out this week, but I pray that this gives you a little bit of preparation for Sunday. And hopefully, hopefully the Holy Spirit will guide us uh, to hear God's word on that day proclaimed so we have some revelation or new insights on that day and I, and I look forward to joining with you at that time. All right again sorry uh, but God bless and uh, we'll try to be keeping this up through the summer and hopefully I'll be back on schedule next week.